Hello. My name is Barbara. I'm 35. I'm an artist, a daughter, a sister, an aunt, an ex-wife, a suicide survivor, a friend, a manic depressive, an ambassador of sea change and a craft business owner. I became part of the solution of breaking the stigma around mental illness when I started telling my truth at an event in Navan in 2009. The first time I told my story to a group of people I did not know in a crowded room, I was afraid of what the consequences might be, but I was more afraid of what staying silent would do. For the first time, I saw people united because of mental illness. I know that they heard my story, but within my story, they heard their own. My story has touched so many, not because it is unique, but because it is happening to so many of us. I always thought that I was alone in my suffering, but now I know how many hundreds of people around the country desperately need help, and I want to be part of that solution. Illness is not something that anyone would actively wish to have in their lives. It's something negative that happened to, to us, and in many cases is out of our control. We need to start helping each other, to learn to be more open and to talk more. We need to realise that it's up to us to break the silence of stigma and create journeys of recovery, and that every single one of us has the power to do it. I'd like to share part of my story with you today, and more importantly, some of the things that have helped me along my journey. I started getting sick when I was about 12, but nobody knew what was happening. Everyone assumed it was the usual hormone changes associated with becoming a teenager. I was doing really well at school. My grades were excellent, actually. I just dreaded the people, the bullying, and the horrific cloud that was building in my chest and shutting out the light inside me. By third year, I was turning 14. I hated my life and so much in it. I had dropped out of all of the things I was involved in. I didn't have very many friends, and I had nothing I, had ca I, I, had nothing I cared for for myself. My self-esteem was horrific. Being bullied at school hadn't helped. I had learned how to hate myself all on my own. I couldn't even bear to look at myself in the mirror. I knew that I was bad, but that I was so good at hiding my true self that I had managed to fool everyone else. My 14th birthday proved to me how worthless I really was. I was having a party, and every single person cancelled. They didn't know the others had a course. It was a really good indicator to me of how little people cared. My family cared about me all right. I'm sure they were worried sick. Not eating properly, not sleeping, constantly being sick with different things, crying most nights until I couldn't breathe. I wound up in hospital a week after that birthday, after trying to take my life for the first time. I didn't remember doing it. It was a bit of a shock, actually. But it was a bit of a relief, too. I just couldn't take the pain and the pressure anymore. Then somewhere inside me, a little voice told me to shout, to get help, that I didn't want to die. I just didn't want to hurt anymore. I remember going in the ambulance. My little brother came with me. He was only 10 and I was supposed to mind him that night. He was delighted, of course, to go in the ambulance and the guys were great. They showed him all sorts of gadgets and how everything worked. They even gave him some fruit pastilles. I remember the look on my parents' faces when they finally arrived, devastated. They had no idea. What had they done wrong? When I was finally well enough to leave the general hospital, I had to go to a special unit in the psychiatric hospital, being that I was under 16. I was told it would only be for a couple of days, maybe even a week or two. It was nearly four months. Full of medication, fear and trepidation, I went home and spent some time resting before I went back to school. Of course, I couldn't have known about the rumours going around about me while I was out. I had missed half the school year by the time I made it back. Of course, everyone had made up their own story of why I had been out. Cancer, brain tumour, heart attack, depression. I don't know which one hurt the most. I wasn't strong enough to tell the truth. I didn't know how to say the words that I had been labelled with. I lost a lot of my friends that year. I had a few that stuck by me, but in general we didn't talk about it. We found a way to push it down, to step over it, to skirt around it. I left school after fifth year. Between the heavy medications I was on and the huge stigma that had attached itself to me, I didn't make it to school regularly enough, and when I did, I just wasn't able. Sixth year in a new school was like a new lease of life. I clawed my grades back. I made a few new friends. I dyed my hair poppy red for the first time. Things were starting to improve. The new year brought possibility and hope, and all of a sudden, depression. Like a loud bang, I hurt, hit the ground harder than I had before. I remember being brought by my parents to meet a, speciali a specialist for the first time. 
I was terrified. Hushed tones were spoken and lots of private conversations had. It went on like that for years with admissions to psychiatric hospitals in between. I dropped out of life sometime during those years. Constant medication, fear and ignorance will do that to you. After a long period of nothingness, I started to improve. I wanted life again and I needed something to help me hope. I went back to college and I did a portfolio course to try and kickstart my passion for art again. I had a great year. I was creative. I was happy. I was healthy. I was the best I'd been in years. Somewhere along the way, though, I got lost. I didn't understand it because it had never happened like that before. I was elated. So elated, in fact, that I didn't understand consequence anymore. I didn't need to sleep at all. Nobody could keep up with me. I became a raging alcoholic, a liar, and eventually a recluse. I ended up in hospital again by that autumn. Another couple of years filled with illness followed. It's a general haze and I don't have many memories of that time, but the ones I do are too hurtful to speak about now. Being finally diagnosed with bipolar disorder made things clearer, certainly, but it didn't make things any easier. Instead of being met with fear or confusion, I was shown the face of ignorance. Yes, renaming manic depression helps, helped reduce stigma around it. Most people don't know what bipolar disorder is. I didn't know what it was until I found out that I had it, and then I learned how to be bipolar. I started saying, I am bipolar instead of, I have. When we get a physical illness, we don't say, I am flu, or I am cancer, nice to meet you. No, we say, I have, or I suffer from. We get help, we get support, we get sympathy. Why should my mental illness be any different? If I wore a bandage on my head when I felt unwell, would that help other people to understand me? Living most of my life in fear of my illness allowed it to control me completely. Like a bully at school, my illness tormented me. It beat me senseless and it left me struggling to breathe on a daily basis. I forgot how to function. I forgot who I was and how capable I am. For a very long time, I couldn't understand the normal things or deal with anything more than dressing myself and eating. I was medicated so heavily sometimes that even they became a problem. The fog of medication eventually became so heavy that it clouded my vision and my mind beyond reach. After being out of work and education for so long, I had talked myself into believing that I wasn't good enough anymore. Having mental illness meant that I was damaged goods. I found it difficult to go back to college or go to, for job interviews even, because now that I had lived with mental illness, I was different, <coughs> special, broken. I watched a movie recently with a narrative that was so alive to me that I decided I'd like to share it with you today to start the next chapter of my life, and this is it. Most days are unremarkable. Most days begin and end with no lasting memories in between. Most days have no impact on the course of a life. November the 10th was a Monday. I was put on a life support machine after being found by my brother and sister. I had finally lost the 15 year battle with mental illness and all that goes with it. I couldn't take any more pain or watch my family suffer any longer. I saw my then two year old niece and I knew that I loved her too much to bring my mental illness into the rest of her life. Enough was enough. I decided that killing myself was the best thing that I could do for my family and for myself too. After a week of being kept alive by machines, I started to wake up. And boy, am I glad they didn't have a tire cut that week. I had to learn how to walk again as I had such problems with my legs after being unconscious for so long. I was horrifically underweight. I could hardly breathe from pneumonia and my throat was in tatters from the tubes that had kept me alive, so I had no voice. Desperate to be alive, I finally started my journey into recovery. Today, I am healthy, I am well, and I am very much alive. I am eight years fully off medication now, and I have managed to keep wellness and vitality in my life. I bought my own house six years ago, and I now have just opened my own craft business making sock monkeys and other toys, and it brings me great joy. I have all of the love in my life that I need because I find ways every day in my life to seek it out. Today and every day, I want to speak out about the stigma around mental illness. If I had not been so frightened of what was happening to me, had I gone for help earlier? Had I understood how much I actually could do for myself? My mind boggles at how different my life would have been and how the lives of my family and all of my friends who spent hours and days praying like crazy that I wouldn't die or end up a vegetable 
how their lives would have been different if I hadn't got that sick in the first place. The sad thing is, mental illness is avoidable, it is preventable, and it is curable. For years, all I saw was a future of terrifying sadness and illness, and now, because I came so very close to death, I live every day like it is my first and last. I understand now that my life is my own, and only I can be responsible for it. It's not up to anyone else to fix me. It's not the doctor's job. It's not my family's job. It's not my friend's. It's mine. I have finally learned how to deal with stress and worry. I eat properly for my own body now. I sleep properly. I spend time with the people who I love and who love me. I get help when I'm not managing as best as I would like. I deal with things as they come up and I face into every small thing instead of burying it and allowing it to fester and grow inside me like a nuclear time bomb. I have learned to treat myself in a way that any good friend would, that I am a good person, and I deserve all of the best chances in life, just like everybody else. If I knew half of what I know now about mental health and illness, I need not have wasted half of my life and all of my growing years in hospital, on heavy medication and in fear of my own illness. So let's talk for just a minute about the possibility of wellness and the responsibility each of us has for our own health and well-being. We need to start our own journey into recovery instead of always being dependent on others to fix the situation. For most of my life when I was ill, I expected somebody else to fix it. I expected my doctor, my family and friends to fix me. For every year that I heavily depended on somebody else, I lost a little bit more of my own ability to look after myself. In finally learning to open and to talk, to get help and support, I found a strength that I never knew I had and I got better. It's been a really slow journey, but it's been the most incredible and the most rewarding one. All of us are entitled to that. All of us are special and all of us deserve happiness and health, regardless of what stigma tells us. I may have a disability, but I am able. So let's talk for just one minute about ability, possibility, responsibility, capability, the possibility of wellness, the responsibility each of us has for our own health and well-being, the capability we all have within ourselves if we choose to believe it and allow it out. Impossible? Look again at that word. It actually says, I'm possible. The truth is this. If you give a little bit of time and space for wellness, it will come wholeheartedly into your life. If you choose to ignore it and focus more on the issues of your illness, it will diminish further and allow the illness part to take over and become even stronger. The kind of things that changed my life are not big things. They're not difficult things. And in fact, most of them are so simple that I felt like an idiot when I found them out. The obvious ones are sleep, good food, and getting my body physically active. The wonderful thing is that most of the things that helped me get back on top of my life were free. They were all manageable and they were all things I could do completely by myself. Most of the time, it's basic and simple things that we know we should do, but we don't because we don't have time. One of the big things for me was learning how to deal with worry and how to worry more efficiently, learning to say no, learning to make time for myself to switch off. This doesn't come easily to me. I've worried chronically all my life. I won't lie, it took time and effort and sometimes lots of tears, but I found ways that suited me in how to effectively deal with how I worry. Cognitive behavioural therapy was one of the tools that helped, and from that I learned lots of small tips that I use regularly now. Meditation is another tool that I've come up against a number of times in my life. I say come up against because I always hated it. It stressed me out and it wound me up more. Until I actually learned about it, and then I tailored what it was that suited me. Now I use it in my daily life without any big deal, and it has a huge and immediate effect. And actually I'll just say, my heart was racing when I was sitting there, and that mindful minute totally changed everything. And in that moment, I forgot that I could have done that. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for that minute, because that helped me. And that's the small stuff <coughs> that I'm talking about. I also learned about fear, about saying I'm not okay, and trying to be okay with that. About feeling terrified when I hit a bump, and yet somehow knowing that I'll get through it. About learning how to be aware of my past. One day, he just said, I don't want to be married anymore. And with that, my fairly new fairy tale, Perfect Life, ended. I went into free fall. I couldn't eat or sleep. I couldn't stop crying. And I couldn't focus on anything long enough to do very much. 
Everybody held their breath and waited to jump into action to protect me from myself and the demons that were waiting to take hold. But something different happened this time. I sat down with my family and we had a very direct and very blunt conversation about how I was feeling and how I used to cope. We talked about suicide because that had always been a go-to option for me before. <coughs> and that's when I realized it wasn't an option anymore. Not only did I not want to die, I really wanted to live. I wanted to live so badly that I was desperate to do anything that I could do to get out of the hole I was in and just be me again. So I went to my GP and as a precautionary measure, I decided that being on short-term medication would help me. It was years since I'd taken anything and I had huge feelings about it. But logic told me that anything that would help would be better than risking getting worse. And then I started helping every other part of my life. I redecorated my house. I planted hundreds of flowers in my garden. I made an effort to see my friends more. And most importantly, I looked after my health and my well-being. I ran several times a week and I did yoga every day. I made sure I ate every day too and eventually I started finding out that I was really inter interested in nutrition, so I started learning about that too. <coughs> and then eating even better. I'm grateful for the test that my ex-husband ex leaving gave me. It made me realise that I've been through worth, worse and that I could cope, that I would manage and that things would somehow work out. I didn't give up, and now I'm the best me that I've ever been. Life gets tough sometimes, and I still worry. I get frightened of not being strong enough or not being able to manage. The what-if factor terrifies me on occasions, but the rest of the time, I'm happy. I work really hard at staying well. I try and stay on top of things, and I keep people in the loop so they're always on the same page as to where I'm really at. Being Irish, I know that most of us like a good cup of tea. It's amazing how many things have been solved over a cuppa. Don't forget this incredibly valuable too, in your home life, your school life, and your work life. Linking with communities, organizations, and supports surrounding us are hugely underused tools. Look around you today at the wonderful people in this room. We're all here for the same reason. Make time to connect with each other and see how we can help to make each other's lives better easier and a little happier. I'm young, I've had severe mental health difficulties and I don't care who knows. I'm proud to be here with you today and speak about it. Fear and stigma ruined my life and very nearly took it from me. I hope that the story of my life helps other people in their recovery. It helps them overcome the difficulties that they have facing their own mental health problems in an open way that's needed. I am more than my mental, health Ill, my mental ill health history or my diagnosis. I'm a whole person. I'm a sister, an aunt, a friend, a human being. Thank you for seeing me as I am today. <laughs>